they don't really know how to combat them. There's not a lot of uh, general knowledge among the, especially the teenage demographic about meditation Absolutely. and yoga and all these other holistic yes. methods. Yes, you're right, darling. It's so good you've done that. It's amazing. So go on. So uh, thank you so much once again for joining us. Happy to um, be here, Anish. Delighted. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you so much. So uh, what I've done, of course, our conversation will flow naturally, but uh, just to kind of give it a guide, I wanted to break up the interview into two main segments. So I thought first um, we could discuss maybe some just general questions, some basic philosophical concepts mm -hmm. that might relate to mental health and the respective issues we're seeing, with, especially within the teen de mm -hmm. demographic today. And then the second segment, I've aimed it more towards channeling those um, issues into how they can be solved with meditation and how you specifically um, incorporated meditation into your life. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, the first question I have is kind of just to put it in, you know, synchronous perspective. I know mental health is becoming a huge topic of discussion now, especially given the pandemic and its effects on social interaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've personally as a teenager, um, I'm, I guess I'm speaking on behalf of most teenagers when I say I went from seeing my friends uh, nine, eight, seven times um, every week to now zero, you know, there's... Um, no possibility for interaction anymore. So what piece or pieces of advice would you impart to students during the pandemic to maintain a level of like sanity and happiness amidst everything that's going on? Well, I mean, that's an enormous question, isn't it? You know, it's a huge question. So maybe we, I mean, all I can do, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a Buddhist, and as you can see, I'm a Buddhist and the way I'm dressed and there's Buddha. So I can maybe perhaps talk about the Buddhist approach to the mind. Right. I think this is something, I mean, in the West, I think, or in our modern culture, we, we all know about Buddhism, you know, but we tend to, we have probably have fairly cliched views about what it is. And certainly most people maybe might interpret, you know, might um, relate it to what's known as mindfulness meditation, which is certainly one of the meditations that is around at the moment. And there's very many variations of it. But actually, the Buddhism is really, um, I think the Buddha, this person who lived in India two and a half thousand years ago, we know about the Buddha, but we sort of have all these mystical ideas about what he is, right? But actually he was this human being. And in India, we don't, we don't know much about this in our culture. In India, there's extraordinary sort of system of, a, of, of, of um, mental knowledge back then. I mean, it was the Dalai Lama who said recently, I always quote him, he said it were these incredible Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who actually began the investigation into the nature of self. What are we? Who are we? What is a person and the expertise in Buddhism is actually to know the mind and so any kind I mean there are hundreds of meditation techniques so I can talk about the Buddhist approach but that the reason you would even sit to meditate it's not some magical thing there's certain ways we can meditate but the real thing is to understand what goes on inside our mind so we think about it Anish from the time we wake up in the morning and the time we go to sleep at night we never pay attention to our thoughts until they're screaming until we're, we're feeling terrible until we're anxious until we're having you know the heart is beating until we can't get out of bed one morning because we're so depressed or until you're so angry you want to kill somebody we don't pay attention until it's too late so the really practical approach in Buddhism is using these skillful meditation techniques which can have an initial benefit but the real benefit is that you they help you learn to become conscious of all these thousands of thoughts raging in our head like I said from the time we wake up in the morning until the time we go to sleep you know so we and then so so that's the real job and then as one of my teachers says we have to learn to become our own therapists so the real job as we go along in our lives is to become conscious of say the jealousy that's arising the attachment the fears the anxiety the the anger the hurt all these things we we call emotions but we again we don't notice them until your body feels it and until it's too late so this practical approach in buddhism is just to use skills that in the beginning of the day, throughout, in the end of the day, you know, that you practice a practical kind of meditation skill that can help you become aware of what you're happening. And then you can learn to be like your own friend. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but part of the practice in day to day, you notice you're feeling anxious, you notice you're feeling jealous, but we don't know what to do with it half the time. But when you can hear the thoughts that inform those feelings, you can begin to have these conversations with yourself. And literally, there's no thought we can't change. I mean, there's a type of therapy that's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is really what the Buddhist approach is. Cognitive therapy is learning to know what you think and knowing that we have the power to change our own thoughts. I mean, what happens is we get angry. We assume we just have to follow it. We assume we have no choice until you crash, you know. But we, when we hear the thoughts before it becomes emotion, and that takes time, then we can learn to readjust our thoughts, literally kind of write new scripts in our head. That's the long-term approach in Buddhism, to really become in charge of your own thoughts and feelings. That's the major approach. Yeah. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it does. It does. I've mm-hmm. actually heard about that cognitive behavioral therapy. I think that's a huge trap that especially, you know, among the teenage demographic we fall into is we think, you know, if we're jealous of somebody, if we're angry at somebody, if we're sad about something, mm-hmm. that's, we just have to, you know, yes, um, we're stuck with it. Different- that's right, no choice. That's right. We have to spiral yeah. down into it. But that's because I think we don't pay enough attention to our thoughts. And, and okay, of course, we can all be brilliant neuroscientists. We can know about the brain, which is very helpful. But if we have to know what we're thinking and feeling. We have to know right then what we're thinking and feeling and know that we have the power to not buy into the unhappy stories. I mean, one approach in Buddhism is we can look into our mind. This seems rather simplistic if we take the, 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 the modern psychological interpretation of what goes on inside us. But the Buddhist one, in, in one way, is quite simple. We have all the unhappy, neurotic, eye-based, fear-based feelings and thoughts, anger, depression, jealousy. We know these words. And then we have confidence and kindness and love and compassion and intelligence and and the buddhist approach is that that stuff that's who we really are and we need to literally grow that part of ourselves but i think we take all our thoughts for granted we just assume they're they're set in stone but they're not and you know we can learn to become familiar and learn to change them and that's really the source of how we can learn to become happy and deal with dramas when they occur you know not completely just get overwhelmed right and that kind of leads into the next question that I had here too. You know, one of those feelings that, we, um, especially among the teen- teenage demographic, we tend to not feel is self pride. Mm. So, you know, as someone who's a teenager, I recently went through a phase in high school where I thought, you know, I'm not good enough for my friends, right. or are they talking about me behind That's my right. back? Um, am I going to disappoint my family? Mm. You know, stuff like that. Are they going places and not inviting me? Mm-hmm. So, um, I think that all stems from this lack of self. Res- right. I don't want to say respect, but self pride. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so. I know you've written some blog posts about self-respect and showing gratitude Mm -hmm. towards oneself. Mm -hmm. So is there any advice that you would give even from the Buddhist perspective on how exactly to shift your mindset in a way that Mm -hmm. allows for that self-respect? Well, you know, it's, it's really something that if I take the Buddhist analysis, but I think if we look at it, we'll recognize it, whether we're a teenager or we're 97, you know, it's really fundamental in the, in, in that we, you know, that we've got this, um, Okay, Buddhism uses this word attachment, which sounds kind of cute. You know, I'm so attached to chocolate cakes. I'm so attached to my boyfriend, whatever. But the Buddhist analysis makes a big distinction between the neurotic, unhappy feelings and the positive, optimistic ones. And we can see the difference ourselves. So attachment is one of the major ones, which seems kind of a curious term for us. And what it is, is it's multifaceted. And I'm going to get to exactly your point, you know, that it manifests in a multitude of ways. Well, the deepest, most primordial level of this attachment is actually the energy of dissatisfaction. And that, that's exactly what you're talking about. I am not enough. No matter what I get, it's not enough. No matter how much I pass my exams, not enough. No matter how beautiful I think I look, it's not enough. No matter how much people say they love me, it's never enough. And it's an automatic assumption that we run to. It's kind of ironic that it's the irony of ego that we have this low self-esteem, this lack of self-pride, as you said. And it seems peculiar that we should have that. And so naturally, if I feel I'm not enough, then where do I look to make me feel I have got enough, we have to look outside. And where do we look mostly? We, we, we look at the cake, we look at the, you know, at the, at the possessions. We want to have, you know, have those things. But the real one, the real suffering is we, we, because we think I am not enough, we assume someone else has to make me feel happy. So we want other people to praise us, other people to show that they love us. It's a bit like, you know, so we don't have enough confidence to know that I'm okay in myself. And this is profound. And everybody suffers from this. That's why we, like, all those things you just said is exactly what we feel. Because we're, what are we doing from the time we wake up in the morning until the time we go to sleep? We're not paying attention to this we're paying attention out there you know and on the basis of this feeling I'm not enough well if I get the cake I'll feel better if I get the new boyfriend I'll feel better if she says she likes me I'll feel better we have to rely upon the outside to make us feel we're a valid person which is completely crazy I mean we have to learn to become valid in ourselves and know that we are valid and that if we have got mistakes we fix them and if we have got good qualities we can grow them you know that's the real job to become out like one as I said one of my teachers says become your own therapist learn to really Really know we can learn to change our own mind and we are already everything we are is in here all our qualities are there and we can develop them you know we can we're like this person we know that if you don't learn if you don't know music you can learn it if you don't know math you can learn it but we never think that we can learn to be less neurotic learn to be less angry learn to be more loving and more confident but that's the point we can you know that's our potential and that's what's so powerful we need to learn that mm-hmm. Yeah. So actually kind of like leading off of that too, 
Um, I know like a big topic of interest today, especially among like teenagers is depression and that That's lack right. of like feeling happiness, you know? That's right. So I know from reading, I know from reading your biography that you have experience uh, working with people in prison That's right. and I'm sure that's given you a whole new perspective mm. on this whole happiness topic. Mm. So, um, given this unique experience, what advice would you maybe give to teenagers who are trying to find happiness amidst unfavorable situations? Mm. Well, that's the real test, isn't it? I mean, when everything's going nicely, when the weather's lovely and your friend thinks you're sweet and everything's beautiful, we think, oh, now I'm happy. But sometimes that happiness we have is a bit unstable because as soon as the wrong food comes on the plate, as soon as your coffee is not hot enough, you suddenly get unhappy. And that's what attachment is. Attachment is like this junky in us that is depending on the outside all the time to make me feel good. Whereas if we can learn to be to change our mind itself, that's what genuine happiness comes from. And that's with my friends in prison. I mean, it's so tragic especially in this country. I mean, I work with people in Australia and other countries, but in particular in this country where the numbers are so huge. And, the, and, the, and of course, all the people I deal with over the many years now, I mean, probably 20, 30,000 prisoners have had contact with, and they're all poor. You know, I mean, a huge number of, of black prisoners, of, of Latino prisoners, poor people. I've never, I mean, I have many friends on death row. I've never met rich people in, I mean, on death row, I promise. So it's always the poor people who have no money, no support, who've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just young human beings who've got to look forward to 20, 30 years in these nightmarish dumps, you know. It's very, I mean, talk about depressed. But what's powerful, working with my friends in prison, they know that they can't. They haven't got a key. They can't walk out the door. We can walk out any time from that crummy relationship, even though we don't because we're scared. But we don't have. We, we, we're not locked in. We have the power to change our own mind, to change our own situation. But when you're in prison, you're literally paralysed. You can't do anything. So then I've found over the years, giving these Buddhist tools and giving Buddhist teachings and the ones who want it, you can't force it. I mean, the Buddhist approach is you don't try to convert people. That's very rude, you know. People choose it themselves. That the ones who know, because they know they don't have a choice. They learn to work on their minds. I mean, I've got a friend in death row who's getting ready for his death date. He's been there 30 years. He's a, basically a good human being, but like many people in the wrong place at the wrong time, guns, drugs, you know, but a good human being. He's an incredible human being and he's getting ready for his death date. He says, I'm ready for that electric jolt, Rabina, because he really knows he can change nothing but his own mind. Whereas if you, if you and the, equally my friends in prison who don't realize they can change their own mind, their own thoughts, they just become paralyzed. They're hopeless. They're full of misery, anger, resentment. And I mean, the sentencing is terrible. The place, the prisons are terrible. But when you really know you've got the power to see things differently, that's what changing your mind means. We can learn to see things differently. It takes time. It's not magic. It doesn't happen overnight. But we've got that potential. And the Buddhist approach is every one of us has this incredible potential. Every one of us, no matter how much anger and despair we have, it does it does not define us. It is not who we really are, but we have to discover that, you know. I mean, we're so used to thinking that happiness comes from out there. If we believe that, then we'll be devastated every time. I mean, look at us with COVID-19. Look at us when things go wrong. But if you really know you've got the courage to change yourself, no matter how bad things get, you can navigate it without losing the plot. And that's the thing we have to learn, every one of us. And this is not religion. It's just common sense. It's good psychology, you know. Right. Right. I understand. Yeah. I think it's really interesting how you made the analogy to the key because that's so true. You know, yes. we uh, sometimes feel like we don't have control that's over the right. situations exactly. that are going on um, in our lives. That's but right. in reality, you know, it's just the process of learning that we do have control. That's, right. that that's what's powerful. So, didn't it? That's exactly right, darling. That's what's powerful. We, and it takes time. I mean, you know, I can see in my own process. I mean, we're all young at some point and we all get old at some point if we're lucky enough to live that long. But I mean, I went through from being a Catholic and then I became this raging hippie. Then I, when I remember in the 1960s, I was part of a kind of, I went to, to, to London and I was demonstrating and all the radical left politics and, and, and myself trying to find a way to see the world. I mean, I had I wanted myself to be happy, but I also wanted to see why is the world suffering? What is the problem, you know? So I tried a political approach. I was a radical feminist at some point. I was supporting the black, or you know, the, the black liberation movement back in the 60s and 70s. And then eventually I kind of exhausted all options for what happiness would be. And I realized I had to look at my own mind. I'd never done that. I blamed the entire world for everything, you know? So you understand? So slowly my own process coming to um, learning to know myself, knowing I can change my mind. If I can change my mind and become more stable and more confident, then I can be useful to the world. There's a nice analogy in Buddhism that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So the compassion wing is like, it's what you're doing. You've seen suffering among your, your friends, so you've decided to do something about it. That's the compassion wing. We've got to try to help other people, you know. But if you, if you can't even help yourself, if you are miserable every day, you can't help a fly. So if we put ourselves together first to some degree, then we realize we're all in the same boat and we reach out and we do what we can to help others. It's so beneficial. Right.
that's a very interesting analogy yes i've never heard of that but that's very like relevant especially it's true absolutely it is yeah and um you know i found it interesting that you mentioned anger because uh specifically it, I, you know, I'm kind of basing all these questions off my own experiences. Mm -hmm. But before I began like practicing meditation, I found myself a very irritable person, mm -hmm. you know, like the smallest things would make me angry. Like one, as you were saying before, one bad grade on a test, yeah. one scolding by my parents, mm -hmm. one, you know, anything that happened in one day would just make me very irritable. That's right. And, you know, I feel like a big part of meditation was kind of getting over that mm -hmm. um, constant feeling of irritability mm -hmm. by the smallest things. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, what would be your perspective specifically or the Buddhist perspective about, you know, how to manage this anger and how exactly. to manage this irritation so exactly. it doesn't overtake our um, whole lives and kind of overshadow the happy mm -hmm. happiness that we find in other things? No, that's so, so true. And it, it, I mean, it's, you know, in, one, in the Buddhist analysis, there are many different states of mind we have to become familiar with, but the two that really run us in day-to-day -day life, and they, again, it almost seems too simple, if we realise that the, this attachment, this is like this dissatisfaction, the next energy, the next level of attachment is like, if you're dissatisfied, therefore you've kind of got this emotional hunger, what's missing? Always thinking what's missing, you know, which is the dissatisfaction energy. So you look out there for something, the cake, the new thing, the something this, the new person, all the time hoping something will come. This is constant unhappiness. It's always, and, and it's function, it's, it's dissatisfaction, it's kind of emotional hunger it brings anxiety because the more you depend upon that piece of cake to make you happy after three pieces you suddenly realize you know what have you left with you're unhappy again so we're always following the dissatisfaction and the attachment and the hunger the emotional hunger and in the millisecond you see attachment is always wanting what I want every second it's always wanting only the nice things and that's what we think happiness is when you get what attachment wants the cake the nice word the pleasant weather you know oh wow I'm happy now but it's not stable because the moment's then five minutes later, something will go wrong. Your mother will say the wrong word, the wrong sound, the wrong sound, then you get upset again. So the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants is actually anger. But it's a, again, there's a spectrum. Some people, I mean, I'm, I'm volatile personality, so when I shout and yell, that's the typical kind of way we think of anger. But there are mild versions of anger, irritated, annoyed, upset, frustrated. We have that all the time, but we don't pay attention because it doesn't seem serious. But that's, in other words, there's attachment that's always wanting something nice, always wanting what I want, and it's very primordial, it's very deep, it's a hunger in us, and then as soon as it doesn't get what it wants, which is a thousand times a day, that's aversion, which is the mild level of, of anger. So there's the, the volatile level is anger, shout and yell, then there's milder levels, annoyed, irritated, upset, then there's a finally depression and despair, and the trouble is we don't pay attention until it's too late. So when you can, from doing meditation, even though you know you, you discussed your technique, which is using the breath, but what you're really doing is, because your breath is connected to your mind, you're steadying your physical energy, which helps you steady your mind, and then you can access, as you, you're telling me this basically, that you're learning to access your good qualities. So we have to see all of those but we, we, we wait till it's too late that's our problem you know we wait till it's too late so anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants these two and then from these two run us they're so subtle though they're so subtle and it almost seems so simplistic but we've got to become conscious of it and then we can start to navigate it and then when you do get annoyed you can hear it and you just say oh if it's only a, a small annoyance you go oh shut up come on Rabina, relax give it a break don't buy into it but we let it we but that, and then you can make it go away but if it's becoming full-blown anger it's very hard to control it you know so you grab it before it becomes full-blown the same with attachment it's very powerful actually it's very interesting yeah. yes and speaking of attachment i know like um I've read a lot of articles about this too. Yes. And the reason that, uh, you know, a lot of these teenagers face these mental health issues is because it's a dynamic stage in life. You know, we change Absolutely. schools, we change friends, we change right. attitudes, we change priorities. So, you know, I read your blog post about change and I was wondering how would you um, suggest like reconciling oneself with the uncomfortable idea That's of right. constant change? Well, it, it, what it points to, I mean, we have to ask the question, why are we afraid of change? And it has to point to, I think, a deep assumption inside us. And this is a, the point I'm thinking the Buddhist psychology makes. When we really learn to develop these amazing techniques that have been around for 3,000 years, I mean, you know, then what the, one, of the fun, one of the results of getting really focused mind from, from good meditation, this takes time, is that you become you, you're, you're, um, super conscious at a subtler level of what's going on well before it becomes emotional, well before it comes out the mouth. That's the real thing. So when then, And then you also notice in your mind all these levels of assumptions. So one assumption we have, because we have this incredible attachment, this neediness, this emotional hunger for, for everything to be lovely, 
It's fairly, it's, we desperately need everything to be lovely. And the millisecond it's not lovely, we have a panic attack, which is called anger or anxiety or whatever. So one of the assumptions in there also is when something nice happens, because attachment can't bear to think it won't happen and can't bear to think it'll change, we freak out. So we have this assumption things shouldn't change. But if we use our intelligence, everybody can see in life, no matter how much you don't want that cup to break, it's going to break one day. No matter how much you don't want to start getting old, and when we're young, we don't think of that. But, you know, you start to look in the mirror and you go, oh, my God, there are wrinkles there. You're shocked by this because if we, we just have these assumptions that things shouldn't change. So when things do change, I mean, look at now, you know, then we, have, we, we can't cope. Whereas if we know that change is natural, it's not meaning in a depressed way. It's natural that things change. It's natural that people leave us. It's natural that people die. It's natural that things break. We don't get depressed about it. You just realize this is life. And when you don't have a fear of things changing, you're able to navigate when the changes occur instead of resisting it, you know. But we resist it now because we think it's wrong. So we, this all demands a lot of looking into our mind and listening to our thoughts. But we're capable of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring that point up because, you know, we I, I maybe phrased my question wrong, too, mm -hmm. because we think that change is what causes anger. Change yeah, that's right. What causes exactly. Happen. But really, it's our perception of that that's, change. That's that exactly the point. That's the total point. We think we're unhappy because the cup broke. No, you, you, you're unhappy because we're attached to it being there all the time and we assume it shouldn't break. So we have these wrong assumptions, but they're hard to see. We've got to really look into our minds deeply and then we change our assumptions and then we become brave. I mean, this is, again, my friends in prison. I mean, that change is shocking, you know, to go from having an ordinary life, especially if you've been wrongly accused, which is very common, and suddenly you're in this garbage dump and you just can't believe the, the insanity that's going on. But when when you know you can't change it, then you can change your mind. When you, I mean, there's a saying in Buddhism, if you can change something, please change it. But if, what if you can't? And half the time we can't. So then we learn to change our approach to it. We change our perception of it. It's very powerful. Right, right. Yeah, so now taking all of that and kind of um, guiding it towards like the meditation aspect uh -huh. of it, you know, I had this misconception, I too had this misconception a couple of years ago regarding the simplicity of meditation, as I said before, you know, um, and I, I've seen it among my peers too. We think that given its simplicity, there's no way it can possibly, you know, work all these wonders that we hear about in the news or the media. So, you know, as someone who's been practicing for so long, mm -hmm. how would you respond to this misconception about the simplicity? Well, I, I don't even know if I can say it like that because, in you know, in Buddhism and especially in Tibetan Buddhism, which is my tradition, it's, I mean, there's, there's not just one or two types of tech, meditations. There are many kinds of meditations. I mean, the one you've mentioned, which you probably talk about on your website, I don't know, is is something that's it's been, it's obviously somebody, um, it's something, I've never heard of it. It's not a Buddhist technique. It's probably come from Buddhism because he's pretty much the master of this stuff two and a half thousand years ago. But, and that's perfectly fine. Everyone's allowed to make up what they like. There are hundreds of techniques and different things work for different people. So um, in one sense, you know, okay, in one, some people will do meditation and it has no effect. They can't stand it. It freaks out. For me, when I began, I, I had no interest in sitting down quietly and watching my breath. I thought it was the most boring thing I've ever heard. Everyone's so different. So for me, this approach of becoming familiar with my mind, not even necessarily on my seat or on my cushion, but this has been the major approach for me. Each of us is different. Some people need to do a technique every day. Other people do different things. And we, as well, we have other kinds of meditations, visualization techniques, like in the different centers when I teach. There's so many kinds. P people, some people love those. We have a, a visualizing of the Buddha, like a female Buddha, for example, called Tara, and she she's represents optimism. Optimism. So you visualize light coming and then you visualize internalizing that. Some people love those techniques. So there's many kinds of techniques, many kinds of approaches. But for me, the point of all of them, they, they you know, whatever reason, see, so you have done this particular technique and even, and you talk about, you know, how you work with the breath. But what's, what has happened for you actually, because you've got all these good qualities, I mean, you've got access to your intelligence, you've got access, this technique enables you to access the better parts of yourself. You, you become more conscious. You didn't say those words to me but my sense is this simple technique that you've been doing has enabled you to become more conscious of your own mind and more conscious of your own positive qualities that's really what's happening but you, you, even though you didn't say it to me like that so there are different techniques for different people some are immediately beneficial some people have to work for years at it it's not being depressed but I mean it's, it's very different approaches 
Mm-hmm. But the key thing, whatever technique we use, is to be help us doing what I'm talking about, become more conscious of what is going on inside us and know that we can work with this, we can navigate this, and it is we are not set in stone. We've got positive qualities, we've got incredible positive qualities, and then we can learn to emphasise less our negative ones and buy in buy into the negative stories less and begin to buy into and, 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 and have confidence in our positive qualities because that's the real benefit in the end. That's the real job that's happening, you know. Right. Yeah, I found it interesting, actually, that you said at first you two thought that, you know, sitting in a room and uh, paying attention to your breathing was boring. And I think that's a thing that a lot of us, like me too, personally, when I first heard about it, I I was not intrigued by it at all. I thought that, you know, that's just a waste of time. It's boring. I have better things to do. And I think that's a reason that a lot of people don't even look into the practices mm-hmm. because there's this, um, the media portrays it as, you know, sitting in a room and watching your breath, which is what it is, you know, and I feel like that turns a lot of people away. So how would you say, um, or how would you suggest that, especially, you know, teenagers who are worrying about 500 different things at once and, uh, you know, um, don't necessarily want to commit to something that they don't have time for, how would you say to, uh, you know, overcome that, overcome that, that anticipation of boredom? Well, Okay, that's only one part. And when I said I, I, I didn't want to do it, it's not so much because it was boring, because I had so much berserk energy. You see, you've got, you, we're all different kinds of people. You, you're a kind, mm-hmm. it seems to me, from the little bit of meditating you've done, you know, it's, it's helped you, what I'm saying is it's helped you access your positive qualities. But how old are you now? I'm 18. Okay, when I was 18, I was a complete mess. There's no way in the world my doing the technique that you did or any technique simply like watching the breath that I wouldn't have had the slightest interest back then. I'd, I had no concept of that kind of thing. It was not how I was. And even when I did meet the Dharma and, and Buddhism, and I was 30 at the time, the, I, it's not because I found it boring. It's because my energy was so 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 outrageous. I was so uncontrolled and so volatile, my mind so busy. It was not appropriate for me to sit down and watch my breath. So what you've got to understand is different techniques work for different people. Mm-hmm. So it's not a magical thing, but you, somehow for you just to do that, and it seems to me you've got very good qualities. I mean, the very fact that you're even making doing a website to help other people, that would not have occurred to me at the age of 18. It took me until I was 35 to even think I wanted to help other people. So we're very different, every one of us. Some people when they're 18 are a complete disaster. I was a disaster. I didn't know my good qualities. I couldn't even access them. It took me a long time. And many people, I'm sure you know about the world. Some people have a terrible time when they're 18. You know, I mean, overwhelmed, depressed every day. No watching their breath for a thousand years is going to help them. Everyone's very, very different. You understand what I'm saying? I'm sure you do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Yes. I understand. So we have to find, there's many, I mean, you know, in what, that's what's marvelous about what you're doing. You're, you're providing different opportunities for people to different to hear different views. And each of us, anyone listening, for example, to me or other people, some people might not like what I'm saying. Other people might really like it. And that's why it's so nice that you can provide different things for different people. But the, the bottom line for me is whatever techniques we use is somehow to have this, incre- we need to develop this confidence that we do have potential, we do have marvellous qualities, no matter how bad things are, no matter how depressed we are, no matter how overwhelmed by bad th- suffering in life, we've got the potential to change our minds. That for me, I don't mind what techniques you use, that for me is the bottom line. That, and Because I think in our culture, I mean I have emails from people who ask me for advice, this is my job, you know. And one person recently, because he has all these, he, he, he panics all the time and has really depressing, angry thoughts, crazy, crazy thoughts. And he said, and I, my therapist says, well, basically, you're going to have to live with this. You're not going to be able to change. I mean, that is how we think in our culture. And that is absolutely beyond shocking. I mean, the fundamental, you know, you talk about change. The fundamental teachings in Buddhism, and it's sort of logical, that everything can change. Nothing, there's nothing set in stone. But we have a feeling, the irony of ego is, I feel I'm hopeless. I'm no good. I can't do it. And then we believe those words. That's the tragedy. But we can even have some confidence that our, I mean, the Buddhist view is our mind is naturally clear and pure. We have this marvelous potential. You know, the virtue and kindness and love and compassion and intelligence, they're at the core of our being. And depression and anxiety and anger and fears, they are not at the core of our being. So I think even to hear those words is very encouraging. That's the bottom line for me. And then we will find the techniques that work for us. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I understand. Mm. Yeah. So as someone who's also been practicing for so many years, what's one of like the biggest misconceptions maybe that you notice about meditation and these techniques that you keep referring to? 
Well, I'm not even really referring to techniques, am I? You, you keep saying that, but I'm not saying that. I'm, I've, I hardly mention the word technique. I hardly, I'm talking about the job of knowing your mind. I'm not even implying a technique. There are techniques. There's, I mean, so first of all, maybe let me ask you what you mean by meditation, because you, you keep using that word. Mm-hmm. So tell me what you mean by yeah. it. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I like when I think of meditation, obviously, I'm thinking of my own experience. So I'm thinking of, you know, sitting in a room breathing, doing the DMT breathing that I was talking about. But obviously, I know there are so many like diverse array of experiences that people have. And as you said, you know, it's important to find the one that fits you because one technique that works for somebody will not work for Mm. the next person. That's right. So 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 the bottom line for me, the point for me, tech, if you say the word meditation, meaning a technique, and when we say that, we usually visualize a person sitting quietly. There are many of those, and so many of those, and there's many, but the bottom line is what I'm trying to say. The reason behind any of those techniques is so that you can learn to access your good qualities. That's the point. If you just by watching your breath kind of feel a little bit better every day and think you can, you know, that's too superficial. The bottom line in Buddhism is we need to cultivate those positive qualities because they are who we really are for our benefit. That's the wisdom wing. And then so we can be of benefit to others. That's the compassion wing. So whatever method, whatever external technique of so-called meditation we do use is going to enable us to become familiar with our own mind in the most imp- intimate way to give us the confidence to know that I can change day by day and deal with whatever happens. And then I can learn to be of benefit to others in the compassion wing. That's the bigger picture, in other words. That's the bigger picture. That's the point I want to say. Okay. And yeah, it's hard. I, I mean, it's hard work because, you know, we can see also with you, you can see, I mean, you seem to be very fortunate. You've probably got a good family, right? And you have I mean, and more than, forget your good family and forget your schooling. And I mean, you're clearly intelligent. You're clearly very compassionate. That's, and you've obviously got some enough confidence to be able to start a website to help other people. That's unusual for 18. I mean, some people when they're seven are like this, but not often. Many times we're overwhelmed and tortured when we're, when we're younger. We haven't got a clue about the outside world. We're completely self-obsessed. We're completely depressed and unhappy and anxious. You know that, you know? So we've all got different kinds of minds. So how fortunate you are. Okay, the Buddhists, you would talk about karma. You must have done hard work in the past because now you got born and you're carrying on your good work. But I mean, we've got to see that there are people who are much more suffering. You understand what I'm saying, don't you? Really mentally suffering, overwhelmed by anxiety, overwhelmed by depression, can't see past their own nose. So all I'm saying is there are so many kinds of people, but the, the fundamental point for me is to have this confidence that, there is, I, I have got marvellous potential. Every one of us has got that. And then to find the, 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 the methods that work for us. Some people mightn't like Buddhism. Some people prefer to have Christ, become a Christian or whatever they want. Do you understand? So right. I'm saying a more broad point all the time. Mm-hmm. Do you understand my point, sweetheart? I do, I do. Good. So just, just to like clarify, just to summarize what you're yes. saying, um, just so I know that I'm understanding yes. correctly, is that meditation, you know, I, I, I think I understand what you were saying, that meditation isn't about, you know, meditation will not directly change anything within you it's it's changing your mindset that, that's right uh, that's right the exactly. that's the point sweetheart in other words sometimes the biggest misconception about meditation is it's some kind of magical tech it's like an alternative to a pill and you right. take it and everything suddenly works that's beyond naive i mean right. another way of putting this you know it's in other words for you just doing this simple technique has helped the real thing that it's, it's not as if the technique is so clever in itself but just that small technique has been enough catalyst for you to access your positive qualities that's what yeah. i'm hearing with you someone else might do it and it won't even t- i mean the number of people i meet who say i've tried meditation i can't stand it it doesn't work and they're miserable they're depressed for 27 years even people trying for 27 years and they're still miserable and depressed so we've got to know where we're at ourselves so the bottom line for me is whatever technique we use it's a, 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 you know sitting down closing your eyes and doing something it's a method to help us get in touch with ourselves. that's the real work that's the real work I mean some people do yoga and find that I mean there's a friend of mine in prison now she's out of prison now she's old but she was wrongly accused when she was a young mother with a wife with a husband and two kids hitching in, in Florida there were these hippies and they were wrongly accused of killing two policemen they were on she was on death row for 17 years her husband was executed I mean she lost her children the most nightmarish experience she was in her own cell in isolation for years with just a bible living in hell with this wrong conviction normal some people go completely mad you know but she had this powerful ability to realize she came to this herself she had no choice she knew she could change her mind she knew she had the choice she knew she could work with herself she had nothing else to work with but it's, when i hear stories like that it's very inspiring no matter how bad our life is no matter how much suffering no matter how bad our parents are no matter how much the bad the racism is and this suffering is terrible in life 
then no matter how bad they are, we have got the power to look inside and it, it happen. Sometimes it's more quick, sometimes it's more slow, depending on the person. And the bottom line is to con and, and to sustain that and grow our, in other words, grow our self as a person, not just be a mathematician or a nurse, but grow our own inner potential, which means your love, your wisdom, your kindness, your generosity, your self-respect, lessen your attachment, your fears, your anxiety, and your jealousy, because they're not set in stone. And the Buddhist approach is why we suffer is because of the neuroses, and why we are happy is because we can access our good qualities. That's, that's the way of analyzing it. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete yes. sense. That makes some people do sense. yoga. You can say some people play tennis. I mean, I remember when I was younger, I really was into martial arts and it was a very powerful practice for me because it was a very good discipline and it helped me. It was a discipline of the body, but it helped me get the discipline of my mind. And I remember going, my teacher would teach kids. This is in London. And these young working class kids, these young black kids, like Indian kids, working class kids, you know, poor white kids. And they were all out of control, berserk kids, just like all of us. But this this teacher, because he, he was a Buddhist and he did kung, you know, kung fu, he was an incredibly wise teacher. And I mean, these 60, 70 children, I'd watch the class. This was their, this was their inner world. Work. They helped. They, they became more disciplined, more self-respectful, and therefore more respectful to others, and therefore more happy. So th this is another way. It was many methods. The bottom line is that they lead you to become aware of yourself, conscious of your good qualities, know that the other stuff is there, but it doesn't define us. But and to have the courage to own it, and to, and that means we become less like a victim. We become more optimistic, and we blame the world less, and we become more powerful in ourselves. That's the bottom line. Whatever method we do, it should lead to that. You know, there's long-term stuff as well. I mean, the Buddhism, Buddhism eventually says we can get rid of the rubbish completely, but that takes time. But the bottom line is what I'm saying. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That makes complete sense. Good. I completely understand. Yeah. 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 Good, darling. Um, yeah, that, those are all the questions I had, okay. actually. You answered everything very thoroughly. Thank you so Good, much. Sweetheart. Good, Good enough. Definitely gave me a lot of insight. Good. You know, I think I, too, was under the impression, not um, completely mm -hmm. under the mm -hmm. impression, but there was an element of my mind that was thinking that meditation was like some magic pill, like that's you were right. saying. That's right. And everyone who everyone who did it would feel the same yes, effects. But, not. you know, thank you for giving me that Good. insight. I, I know that, um, you know, I now know that it's about being self-aware and about changing your own attitude that's first. Right. And some of us have the capability to do that more easily and some take a longer time to do it. It seems to me I'm very impressed by how you've managed, you know, but you know, you have to keep going though and, and, and learn more and more about yourself, which means know all your qualities, to know your good qualities, but also be conscious of your, of your anxieties and your own fears and your own rubbish and own those things. And then we can, when we own them and not be afraid of them, then we can learn to be out. As my teacher says, be your own therapist. We, we can change our mind. We can turn ourselves into any person we want to become, you know. It's marvelous. Mm -hmm. I think you're doing a great job. I admire what you're doing. Thank you so and much. You I admire doing. what you're doing good, as well. Sweetheart. Good, sweetheart. Good, good, good. Okay, yeah. that's it? Yeah, that, that, that's all I have. Is there anything else that you would like to say? No, I'd just like to sing a tiny prayer, which is just saying, may compassion grow and grow in the hearts of all. A very tiny one, okay? It's in Tibetan. Shall I sing that? Yeah. Okay, go just ahead. to finish. A nice way to finish. Sure, sure. Okay. Jang chub sem chog rimpoche, ma ke panam ke gyuchig, ke panyam pa me pa yang, gong ne gong du felva shog. That's all. Oh, thank you. All thank right, you darling. so much. So may Thank compassion, you. may we get wisdom, which means develop ourselves and our marvellous qualities, and then so we can develop the compassion wing. We can help others then. Mm -hmm. All right? So keep moving. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sweetheart. Bye. Bye.